Hey there, this is James Wolfen from Blue Thumb and Metro Blooms. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of a run through of our Blue Thumb Bee Lawns workshop. I, want, I really want to thank all of you for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be a part of the uh, Grow Better Garden Summit. I hope you enjoy the material that I'm about to present. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview of our Blue Thumb Bee Lawns workshop. I'm going to try and uh, get through all the main points I would cover in a full workshop, and I hope everyone here enjoys it. So this uh, workshop is put together through a partnership between Metro Blooms and Blue Thumb. Uh, Metro Blooms is a nonprofit organization based out of Minneapolis, and Blue Thumb is kind of a collection of different partners that are all focused on uh, native plantings, green infrastructure, and just trying to protect water and our pollinators uh, in our local ecosystems. Uh, a lot of really great partners helped to put this presentation together. Uh, Sam Bauer, formerly of the University of Minnesota Turfgrass Science Lab, was a big help. Um, I'm your host here today, James Wolfen. I used to be with the University of Minnesota Bee Lab. I'm now working with uh, Metro Blooms. And some other great partners like Bob Dom, Douglas Owens Pike, Anna Bierbrauer, and John Bly have all been uh, extremely influential in putting this workshop together. So let's talk a little bit about bee lawns, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. This was the topic of my uh, graduate research at the University of Minnesota. So I wanna break this down into kind of three subtopics. First, talking about cultural and ecological functions of the lawn, kind of a holistic view of how the lawn is used today. Then I wanna talk about the individual elements of a bee lawn, kind of break things down one at a time for you. And then we'll take those elements, put it all together and talk about bee lawn installation. So let's get started by talking about the cultural and ecological functions of the lawn. So in order to understand the uh, kind of landscape that we're dealing with, kind of the context for this issue, it's important to understand how much turf grass is actually present in the United States. So in the continental US, we've got about 50,000 square miles of turf grass uh, it, across the lower 48. This represents a little bit more than 2% of the continental US. So if you take 50 steps, it's more than likely that one of those steps is going to be on turf grass. When we think about uh, where turf grass is most prevalent, it's all those big cities, all those big urban suburban complexes, a New York City, a Southern California, even my home city of Minneapolis. Uh, what many people don't realize is just how much uh, turf grass there is relative to other crops. So the coverage of turf grass in the United States is three times greater than that of irrigated corn. So we have a whole lot of turf grass here in the United States. And it's important to consider why should we find alternatives to turf? So it might be, uh, I do think that turf is easy to hate on. It's easy to find flaws with, but, it's, but I am a uh, turf grass scientist. I was in a turf grass science lab for a few years after graduating uh, from undergrad. And I do want to point out some of the benefits and also some of the fallbacks of turf. I don't want you to leave this presentation thinking turf grass is bad, we need to get rid of it in every circumstance. I want your line of thought to be, uh, when making land management decision, decisions, it's all about finding the right plant for the right location. And while turf grass can be great for um, keeping erosion away, for providing some green space, um, and turf grass is certainly great for, um, for recreation, sports, things of that nature, in areas where we want to kind of get a little bit more ecological function, there are some drawbacks. So let's talk about those. So there's a potential for pollution, both in the form of over fertilizing over, and in the form of over watering. When we over fertilize, a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus in that fertilizer can run right off into a nearby body of water and result in what we call eutrophication. Uh, with water, that's a little bit of a simpler one. Water is a very valuable natural resource. We want to water as infrequently as possible so that we can conserve this resource. Uh, fossil fuels also probably pretty obvious. Um, short of having an electric mower, if you have a gas powered mower, every time you're mowing your lawn, you are expending uh, valuable fossil fuels. We want to reduce our carbon footprint. We want to make our landscapes as green as possible. So limiting the use of fossil fuels is in everybody's best interest. And then something a little bit more outside the box, but something that's very exciting to me and will certainly be a focus of this talk today is how our current lawns lack ecological function. If you walk through a 
what, what someone would, would consider to be a perfect grass lawn where there's no flowers in it, you're probably not gonna see any pollinators. You're probably not gonna see much wildlife. And there may be a few root dwelling insects and uh, insects that feed on the turf blade, but you're not gonna see those beautiful native pollinators. You're not gonna see the level of diversity that we'd hope for in a green area. And that's what we're gonna focus on quite a bit today. How can we bring ecological function back to the turf grass lawn? And our solution to this problem is to transform the urban lawn. We wanna take traditional turf grass, add in some low growing flowers that provide high quality bee forage and create what we call a flowering lawn. And the whole idea here is we don't wanna completely eradicate the turf grass lawn, we want to enhance it. We wanna add in some of those flowers that provide great nectar, great pollen for our pollinators, but we also wanna maintain that uh, potential for recreation, that traditional aesthetic. So right now what we're trying to do is find that perfect middle ground between what does a human hope to get out of a turf grass lawn and what does a pollinator hope to get out of a turf grass lawn? So let's look at what I view to be the primary goals of a bee lawn. So of course, this isn't all inclusive. Um, this is very subjective. You might have different goals than this, but these are the three main things that I think a bee lawn can stop, can excuse me, can accomplish. First of all, they're low maintenance. Uh, a bee lawn has less mowing, watering, weeding, and fertilizing required as compared to a traditional turf grass lawn. A bee lawn allows us to protect our pollinators. We're bringing flowers back to that surface. And they allow us to improve our water quality. We'll be using a turf grass species, fine fescue, that I'll talk more about a little bit later, and wildflowers that have deeper root systems than conventional turf grass lawns. So if you're trying to think, how can I reduce stormwater runoff off of my property? Many people's first inclination is, um, is a rain garden. What they don't realize is a rain garden only covers that first two, three hundred or so square feet of, of the area you're hoping to improve. And that leaves a whole lot of turf grass left. So I tell people rain gardens are fantastic, but consider supplementing them with a, with, a, um, with a bee lawn. They're very cheap to install, about $50 per thousand square feet, and they will provide some additional stormwater capture. So I do want to elaborate on all of these a little bit further. When I say low maintenance, when I refer to a turf grass species or a flower species or a green surface on the whole as a low maintenance area, the three characteristics I want you to focus on are drought tolerance, how frequently it needs to be water. We want surfaces that get watered as infrequently as possible. I want you to focus on the rate of growth. We want a turf grass species that grows very slowly because this means we don't have to uh, mow it as frequently. And we also want to focus on uh, turf grass species or green surfaces that have low fertility needs. The less fertilizer that we're applying to a surface, the better. That means that there's less of a chance of nitrogen and phosphorus that, uh, that is common in fertilizers to run off our surfaces and enter nearby bodies of water. Disease resistance and insect resistance, I'll leave that off the table for now. That's really for the, uh, the turf grass science junkies, the turf grass nerds in the room, but uh, not necessarily a focus of today's presentation. When we talk about pollinator protection, that's the beauty of bringing back the flowers. Uh, these are three different flowers that I'll talk about in great depth today. They are all included in the bee lawn seed mix. It's Dutch white clover, creeping thyme and self heal, and they all support a great diversity of bees. This will uh, give pollinators access to high quality pollen and high quality nectar all within your lawn. And the one that's less obvious is that tie into water conservation. And like I said before, when we think water conservation in our residence, in the, in the land that we manage, we often think rain gardens. And I think rain gardens are fantastic. Metro Blooms, who I walk for, we do tons of rain garden installations. The thing is, rain gardens are one, expensive, and two, they can only cover 100, 200, maybe up to 500 square feet. And when we think about um, what a typical lawn area looks like, it's so much larger than that. There could be thousands of square feet that we want to manage. And a, and a bee lawn is a fantastic option for all of that remaining square footage. So now let's move on to talking about the different individual elements of a bee lawn. And I always like to say, we're going to build from the bottom up. We're going to start with the turf grass, then we're going to move on to the flowers. And then we'll finally talk about my favorite part, who's actually visiting one of these bee lawns. And we'll start first with selecting a turf grass species. 
I know I might have given a spoiler earlier about which turf grass species we're going to choose, but I want to show you the process of how we made that decision. So when we select turf grass species uh, and we're thinking about being environmentally conscious, what we're generally thinking about is um, how low maintenance or how low input that species is. We want to minimize irrigation, we want to minimize mowing, and we want to minimize the application of fertilizer. Now that we're trying to get flowers to establish alongside those grasses, we need to think about grass as a biological competitor for those flowers we're looking to establish. This means we're now thinking about the morphology of the grass species, how thick or thin the uh, leaf blade is, and also, and probably most importantly, the rate of growth. Let's take a look at this together. If we consider a turf grass species with a fast rate of growth and a wide leaf blade, we run a risk of creating a canopy over the flowers that we hope to establish and shading them out. With this being the case, we would expect low forb establishment. We think it would be really tough for those flowers to get in if they're dealing with a highly competitive turf grass species. Uh, and conversely, if we were to use a turf grass species that has a slow rate of growth and a thin leaf blade, we would view this as a, um, as, as a weaker competitor. We think it would be a little bit easier for those flowers to get in. So we, we believe that if we use a turf grass species with a thin leaf blade and a slow rate of growth, we would see high forb establishment. And this hypothesis was actually tested at the University of Minnesota, where the bee lab and the turf grass science lab came together to see what flowers are able to, to co-establish with which turf grasses. So they took a common floral species, Cura clover, and they tried to co-establish it alongside four different turf grass species. Two species that have thin leaf blades and slow rates of growth, where we expect good results, and two species with wide leaf blades and fast uh, rates of growth, where we would expect low flower establishment. And they asked these very questions. What's the importance of blade width? What's the importance of growth rate? And what they found was that fine fescue grasses and Kentucky bluegrass, those grass species that grow slowly and have a thin leaf blade, really are able to co-establish alongside our flowers. So the graph labeled A shows how much vegetation was able to establish, and that graph labeled B shows how many flowers we're able to establish. And you could see that with both fine fescue and Kentucky bluegrass, we get really good uh, flower establishment, especially as compared to those grasses that had a fast rate of growth and a, and a wide leaf blade. So when we look, when we compare it to the tall fescue and the perennial ryegrass, those two grass species had much, much lower vegetation and floral blooms pleasant, uh, present. Ultimately, when we make that decision of what's better, Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue, we strongly lean in favor of that fine fescue grass because it's also low input. And I'll talk about that in just one more slide. Something that I do want to uh, address is, especially in northern climates, Kentucky bluegrass is often the most common turf grass species used. So if you have a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, you can still establish a bee lawn within it, but we do tend to prefer fine fescue. So speaking of, let's uh, talk about everyone's or at least my favorite turf grass species, fine fescue. So fine fescue is a turf grass species that was actually, uh, it gained popularity because of how well it does in shade. So that picture I have here shows a dense, healthy stand of fine fescue in a heavily shaded area. And that's where fine fescue has traditionally been used. But what we're uh, finding more and more is that it is an extremely low input species. If you want to limit your use of fertilizer, limit your, uh, limit your mowing, and limit your water application, fine fescue does excellent in those conditions, making it an extremely environmentally friendly species. And that's why we are going to be using fine fescue instead of Kentucky bluegrass. It is a very high quality species. It's so adaptive to different conditions, and it's low input. The one negative to keep in mind is that it does have low traffic tolerance. This doesn't mean necessarily that you can't walk on your lawn or have light recreation on your lawn, but if you have dogs running through the surface or you're playing sports on the surface, you know, playing a game of soccer or something, you might want to consider mixing your fine fescue with a different turf grass species. If you know you have a lot of activity in your yard, I would say um, take some fine fescue, mix it with 20 or so percent tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass and spread it throughout your area. 
This will ensure that some turf grass species is going to establish throughout the entirety of your lawn. So moving on from turf grass species, we're gonna talk about the flowers, some of the real stars of this show. So let's talk about how we select floral species for a bee lawn. So when we're evaluating different flowers, we need them to meet a few different needs. First, we need them to be low growing. We don't want to go and recommend di different prairie flowers that are one, two, three, four, five feet tall. Then you completely lose that recreational function associated with your lawn. We try to limit everything to flowers that are three inches or lower when they start to bloom. We also want to focus on flowers that are able to tolerate typical lawn management practices. And here, what I'm really talking about is mowing. When we think about what we're doing to a plant when we mow it, we are cutting off a large chunk of its body. We need to find flowers that are able to establish and bloom through this. And finally, we want flowers that serve as high quality forage for our wild bees. Something that we also tried to do, but it was a little harder than we first anticipated, was to find the native flowers that meet all these needs. So we do have some natives that we're able to establish, but there's, uh, there's kind of slim pickings in that area. So let's talk first about one of my favorite natives, self-heal. So self-heal, the beauty in this flower, and I like to talk about flowers a little bit from the bee's point of view. If you can't tell, I'm an entomologist. Uh, part of the beauty of self-heal is it has this large, at least for its size, this large world bloom. When I say world, um, I'm looking at how the flowers are arranged and how that those, flo those florets arranged to form a really long floral neck. And what that does is it kind of limits the, the types of pollinators that can visit it. Um, it also is a fantastic nectar source and it does really well in full to part sun moist soils. So if you know that your lawn area has a little bit of shade which causes it to retain some moisture, self-heal is a fantastic option for this area. If you, have, um, if you do have full sun and the soils dry out, what you'd wanna keep in mind is as you're trying to get this area to establish it, make sure you're watering at least once per week. Creeping thyme, on the other hand, is very different from self-heal. Now we're talking about these small, wide open blooms. Um, and creeping thyme, if you're in a cold weather area, I know here in Minnesota, our residents love this, creeping thyme has fantastic winter hardiness. And since we're trying to keep these areas low input, it also has really good drought tolerance. So you don't have to water much with this species. If you've got a full sun lawn that gets baked, that has these really sandy soils, creeping thyme is a really nice species to consider using. That third point you see listed, deer deterrent, I'll admit this is a little bit of an old wives tale, but there is some uh, evidence out there to suggest that creeping thyme, uh, the vegetation, the scent of it and the taste of it uh, isn't really appreciated by deer. So there is some evidence to say that you can use it as a border plant to keep away the deer. And finally, Dutch white clover. This is kind of like the Goldilocks of our bee lawn flowers, where it has these nice wide open medium sized blooms. This is important when we talk about pollinators, which I'll do in just a few moments. It's a really great source of pollen and nectar. And what's really most important to the vegetation of your lawn is the fact that Dutch white clover is a nitrogen fixer. It takes that atmospheric, atmospheric nitrogen, brings it back into your soil, which means you don't have to fertilize as much. Nitrogen keeps your plants nice and healthy, so having a nitrogen fixer like Dutch white clover is fantastic for the species that we're putting in your lawn. Another species that's not always included in a bee lawn mix, but we recommend playing with is common violet. Common violet provides some gorgeous color to, to your lawn. It can have both a purple or a white inflorescence. You can even see some uh, within that spectrum, you know, a lighter purple or an off-white with shades of purple. And it's also an early, excuse me, an early bloomer blooming April through June. You'll see limited pollinator use on it. And um, some species that use it are skippers. Skippers are closely related to moths and butterflies. So if you're looking to help out your local skippers and even your bees to an extent, Common violet can have some, uh, can provide some use there. It does well in both sun or shade and it's a nice mowable and walkable species. Here's a picture of it naturalized in a lawn in Minneapolis. And I really think it does provide some gorgeous color to a lawn. For the life of me, I'll never understand how we as a people were convinced that a plain boring 
turf grass green monoculture is more beautiful and more desirable than a lawn that's bursting with color. So what you might have noticed is I have recommended some species that are non-native flowers. So I want to give some thoughts from different experts in the field to kind of uh, lighten those concerns. So Neil Samarja from the National Park Service says that Dutch white clover has been in the U.S. for a long time and is more or less naturalized. I generally don't see it out competing native species. And what Neil does here is he pretty much gives us the definition of a naturalized plant. When we consider non-native species, it's important to consider that they're not all created equal. There are some that are highly aggressive and will outcompete your natives. These species we call invasive. And there are some that can coexist with natives and kind of just uh, form a nice matrix together. And those are what we call naturalized. So all of the non-native species that I'm gonna talk about today are naturalized species that will not outcompete your native plants. Let's take a look at another quote from our good friends at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, where they say, while non-native flowers may be aggressive, they could still be very useful. Dutch white clover, trifolium repens, and creeping thyme, thymus cerphyllum, are two species that benefit pollinators and will flower in a mowed lawn. So here they do recognize that they're not native, but it's important to remember that we're comparing these flowers to turf grass. And as compared to turf grass, they're gonna provide so many benefits where even though they're not native, they're still super useful. So now you guys get the luxury of listening to me totally nerd out about bees. So now I get to talk about who visits a bee lawn. So on self heal, my hypothesis going into my research was that we would see strictly larger bees. We would see large bees like the bumblebee in, uh, in the picture to your right and megachylid bees on this flower because they have long tongue tongues and they can reach the rewards inside the flower. And to an extent, I was right. We saw lots of large bees on self heal, lots of beautiful bumblebees, some megachylids, some other large bee species. Uh, heck, we even saw some skippers on the uh, on the self heal. What came to my surprise was that we also saw really small bees on self heal, and the scientific term for what we saw was it was really darn cute. What the small bees were able to do was they were able to actually crawl into the florets, reach in, grab their nectar and pollen, crawl right out, and continue on their way. So we saw some lacioglossum bees, some osmia, like what's pictured uh, in this image here, in addition to the large bees that we saw. Um, initially, we thought that this, was, this floral species was, was primarily a nectar source, but we saw some evidence to suggest that bees were also getting pollen from this species. And let's take a look at a video I took to explain this. So what I want you to focus on in this video is how the bumblebee species, this one's a Bombus bimaculatus for those taking notes, uh, to notice what it's doing with its front and middle legs. What I want you to try and look for is see if you can catch it scraping the pollen down from its body hairs into its pollen sacs. So now that you've been given a little bit of a primer, here we go. So you see it reaching its head right into the floret, sticking its tongue in, and watch how it right here is scraping with its legs. It's gonna do it again. It's scraping with its legs to get that pollen down into uh, the pollen sacs. There's a really good show of that uh, behavior. And then it flies off on its way. So because we saw it scraping with those front and middle legs, that shows us that it's collecting pollen, that's trying to scrape that pollen down into its pollen sacs. So this led us to believe that um, self-heal, that self-heal was uh, also serving as a pollen source. Uh, from the collections that I did, I saw that more than 95% of bee visitors on self-heal were native species. So if you wanna support your native bees, putting out some self-heal can really do wonders. Uh, with creeping time, the main value that we're seeing is the value to smaller bees. So bees from the species Andrina, species from the genus uh, Laceoglossum, and even what we see here, Augochlorella, they really love that creeping time. Um, and what's also extremely important to note is that it's a late season bloomer. When we think about creating flowers for, for uh, bees within a landscape, I always try and talk about the importance of having staggered bloom times. Bees don't need flowers only in March and April, not only in May and July, not only in August and September. They need forage all throughout the, uh, the spring and summer and fall. Once it's warm enough for a bee to go out and fly, they need food. So if you're trying to figure out a late season source of forage for bees, 
creeping time is a really great option. So that's what I really want to focus on. Creeping thyme is the latest to bloom of all the Bilan flowers. With Dutch white clover, it has these open medium-sized blooms. And with these wide open medium blooms, we see a fantastic diversity of pollinators. So I'm gonna go through them because let's be honest, who doesn't love beautiful pictures of bees? And if that applies to any of you, I hate to say it, you're in the wrong talk. So anyway, this is a gorgeous agapostamin on a Dutch white clover in inflorescence. This is a native sweat bee on a Dutch white clover. Here we've got a bumblebee on Dutch white clover. This is Bombus rufocinctus. And here is our good friend, the honeybee. And the honeybee is actually something that I wanna to touch on. The honeybee was the most common bee species that we saw in Dutch white clover, meaning that this is a great source of forage for both honeybees and native bees. The split we saw was about 40% non-native bees with honeybees being the most common and 60% native bees. So with, oh, excuse me, the other way around, 60% non-native bees and 40% natives. So if you wanna support a mixture of bees, putting in Dutch white clover into your lawn is in your best interest. So once again, 40% natives, 60% non-natives with honeybees being the most common. On Dutch white clover alone, we saw more than 55 unique bee species in just Minneapolis, including honeybees. So you can support an incredible diversity of bees on just white clover. When we bring in those other species, we saw an additional 10 bee species, a total of 65 bee species on our bee lawn flowers. This represents more than 15% of all the bees in the state of Minnesota. So you can have an incredibly diverse lawn just by putting in these three floral species. So I can drudge on about pollinators all day long, but it's important to bring up other benefits. Uh, there's some really great research out of the Chicago area that shows that converting just 5% of your lawn to a pollinator friendly alternative can improve pollination at local gardens and local farms. So if you wanna help local food producers, local vegetable producers, um, putting in some pollinator friendly species can really help them out too. So if you're looking to help out your local gardeners and farmers, consider converting a, part, a portion of your lawn. Okay, now we're gonna dive into the nitty gritty details of bee lawn installation. Before I even get onto it, there are going to be two separate conditions that I talk about. One is an overseeding where we just drop flowers directly over a pre-existing turf stand. The other is a new lawn renovation. These are very different. And I would say to pay close attention to the conditions that are appropriate for each as this will kind of determine the steps you take as a homeowner, as a land manager to get a bee lawn established. First, let's start with when to seed a bee lawn. There are three kind of windows of time that I like to use. Early spring, if you're in Minnesota and this applies, right after snow melt is a great time to consider. Here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to spread these flower seeds uh, right after snow melt and before weedy species can start to grow before they start to accumulate what's called degree days. With the seeding in the early spring, we would expect same year germination of our flowers, meaning that you should see at least vegetation, hopefully some blooms that same spring, summer, fall. And I always recommend supplementing a seeding with an overseeding, where you just kind of uh, spread some seed into the patchy areas of your lawn. So if you do a seeding in the early spring, try and overseed it in the late summer, or early fall, kind of in that August or September window. Speaking of August and September, that's my second favorite, or really that's my personal favorite window of time to do a seeding. Here, what we're trying to do is target soil temperatures that are 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is the sweet spot for cool season turf grass growth. So once again, we would expect same year germination there might be limited flowering, but, uh, but come year two, so after their first, the, the first season of overwintering, you will expect to see a gorgeous, full, dense bee lawn. Um, I do recommend overseeding um, either in the very, very late fall as what's called a dormant seeding. I'll talk more about dormant seeding in just a minute, or waiting until the following spring and sowing in some additional flower seed then. A dormant seeding, which is uh, what the University of Minnesota Turfgrass Science Lab would recommend to you, is when you seed kind of right around Thanksgiving. Your goal here is for the ground to not be frozen, 
but um, be too cold such that plants can germinate the same heat year. What you're hoping to do here is drop your seed, cover it with either a germination blanket or some hydro mulch, which is what you see here in this picture. And, uh, and you won't have your uh, seeds germinate that very same year. They're gonna stay in place over winter and then uh, germinate in the spring. So here the snow cover, which we have plenty of in Minnesota is going to aid the establishment of your bee lawn. And if you seed it around Thanksgiving, you'd expect to see germination and first plant growth uh, right around March or April, whenever the snow starts to melt for you. So now we know when to seed, I wanna talk about those two conditions I mentioned earlier, overseeding versus a new lawn renovation. So when we overseed, this is best suited for when we have Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue already present in our lawn and low weed presence. So if you have a healthy stand of Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue, you can do an overseeding, meaning you just drop some flower seeds directly over the top of your lawn. If this is not the case and you have tall fescue or perennial ryegrass or some other turf grass species, or you just have high weed presence, then you're gonna to wanna to do a new lawn renovation. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about how you can do each of those. I'll talk about how we can do an overseeding, which is a little bit uh, simple. And then I'll talk about how we can do a lot, new lawn renovation, which is a little bit more intensive. So for an overseeding, and remember, this only applies if we have fine fescue or Kentucky bluegrass and limited to no weed infestation. So step one is we wanna mow our lawn as short as possible. After we do that, we wanna rake away our clippings and the goal here is to expose as much soil as possible. If we want our flower seeds to germinate, they need to be able to make contact with the soil. After this, we're going to spread those flower seeds. You can consider combining the seeds with a little bit of compost or a little bit of sand to serve as a bulking agent. Then what you're going to do is you're gonna keep the area nice and moist until you start to see new plant growth. I'd recommend watering two to three times per week until you see that new plant growth. In terms of maintenance, the main thing to consider is to never again mow below three inches. These flowers bloom at right around three inches, so we wanna make sure our lawn is at least that height. Uh, you can trim back in the fall before uh, the, the lawn goes to overwinter. And you really wanna refrain from using herbicides. Remember, we no longer look at flowers in the lawn as a nuisance. We look at them as a source of forage for our pollinators. So if you see something you really don't like, try and stick to hand weeding or using a tool. When we create the bee lawn six for over, the, excuse me, the bee lawn seed mix for an overseeding, here are the rates you wanna use. These are the seeding rates per thousand square feet. So per thousand square feet, you wanna use three ounces of Dutch white clover, three and a half ounces of self heal, and one ounce of creeping thyme. You can go a little bit higher than this, but I wouldn't uh, go too much higher. If you do choose to add in common violet, I would say to use about six ounces of common violet per thousand square feet. So what happens if you have suboptimal turf grass conditions? You don't have the right species, you have lots of weeds, something that's just imperfect. Then what I would recommend for you to do is to just start from scratch. You wanna remove that sod and then spread the seed. And while this will be admittedly a little bit more expensive, a little bit more exhaustive, you should expect to see improved overall results because you're gonna have perfect seed to soil contact. If there's no turf grass in the way, all that seed you're using is making contact with the ground. So when we look about how we would do a lawn renovation, there's a few different options and they range from kind of conventional options to cutting edge. Yes, I recognize it's a little bit of a corny pun, but what can I say? I can't help myself. So I'll talk a little bit about how you could do this with a shovel, how you could do this with machinery and how you could use cultural method, excuse me, cultural methods like a solarization. So if we do removal by hand, I'm talking about using either a shovel or a sod kicker. I would recommend for this for kind of smaller projects, otherwise it's gonna be just too exhaustive. So if you're just trying to do maybe a thousand square feet or fewer, you just wanna have a smaller, more uh, part of your lawn that's transitioned to a bee lawn, then I would recommend doing this with a shovel or a sod kicker and uh, drop in the, the seed in that area. If you're looking at larger projects, there's machinery you can use to help you. You can rent a sod cutter from a Home Depot or another home good supply store. 
You can also rent, rent a machine that's called a dingo that'll just scrape the turf grass right off the surface. And then you uh, have a clear area for dropping that new seed. So a sod cutter or an excavator commonly referred to as a dingo are some machines that you can use to aid in the removal of the turf grass. Um, you'll see in the picture on the right, our crew member is, there's a crew member on the dingo and there's also one with a shovel. Uh, the excavator can be a little bit more difficult to aim than a shovel. So we kind of sometimes do the central portion of an area with the, with the machine. And then we use a, uh, a shovel to scrape the edges. And you can also use cultural methods like a solarization. Um, solarization, the basics of it is you spread some tarp, you spread some plastic over the top of the area you wish to convert. You let it sit there for three or so months in the spring and summer when it's warm out, and it's gonna act like an oven. It's gonna heat up that vegetation and eventually kill it. After that three months or so, you peel back the plastic, you rake away the dead vegetation, and voila, you have a new surface to plant into. What I would say is uh, if you do this, you're probably gonna wanna add to amend your soil a little bit, add in some compost, uh, add in something, a little bit of topsoil that's gonna improve the soil health so that your plants have a better chance of surviving. Uh, if you want more information on this option, I highly recommend checking out the Xerxes Society for Inver Invertebrate Conservation. They have a really great gu guide to organic site preparation methods. The same goes for sheet mulching. Uh, and sheet mulching, I like to call it lawn lasagna where you're pretty much covering the area you want to convert in different layers of cardboard, then compost, cardboard, then compost. You're going to smother that area. And then once the area is fully smothered, the compost is nice and settled. You're going to drop your turf grass seed and your flower seed over the top of it. And, uh, and then you have a nice fresh surface to plant into. Uh, and once again, the Xerxes Society has a really great thorough guide on that as well. For a new lawn renovation, our seed mix is gonna change a little bit. So the flower proportions, the amount of flower seed we're dropping in stays exactly the same. What we are going to add in is quite a bit of fine fescue seed and um, mulch. I would say to even before you apply the, uh, the flower and the grass seed, try to use somewhere between 50 to 200 pounds of mulch per thousand square feet. And once that's done, um, create a mixture of Dutch white clover and the fine fescue seed. So per thousand square feet, you're gonna to wanna to use four to five pounds of fine fescue seed with all of those flowers mixed in with your fine fescue seed and spread it over the top. So let's talk about how we would do that new lawn renovation. So step one is to remove your soil by hand, machine or cultural method. Once that's done, you wanna rake and loosen the soil. This can be done with a shovel, this can be done with a, uh, a power rake, but you just wanna loosen that soil up and add in a little compost over the top, get some nice nutrients in there. After that, you can spread the seed. And I like to recommend using a germination blanket to, for, for the area. This just helps to make sure your seed stays in place. After that, the steps are the same as uh, what we saw in the overseeding, where you wanna keep the area moist until you see new growth. And uh, for maintenance, you're, we're not gonna mow as much, we're going to trim these areas back in the fall, and we're going to refrain from using herbicide as not to kill our flowers. Um, let's take a little bit of a closer look at how we're actually going to spread that seed for a new lawn renovation. Uh, there are certain steps you can take to ensure stronger uh, plant establishment. What I like to do is I like to do a perpendicular seeding, where I spread half of that flower and grass seed walking in the north-south direction, and, I, and then I spread the other half of my seed walking east and west. So we're gonna do this perpendicular. So if we're using uh, five pounds of seed in total, I drop two and a half pounds walking east and west, then I drop two and a half pounds walking north and south. Oh, you're gonna to wanna to lightly rake it in and emphasis on lightly. You wanna just barely cover those seeds with some soil. And finally, directly after you get that seed in place, do one heavy watering directly after, and thereafter, you're gonna to wanna to do some light waterings until you see um, plant growth. So after you do that heavy watering, I would say to water two to three times per week until you see new plant growth. So let's talk a little bit about maintenance. I know not everybody's favorite section of a presentation, but certainly important for plant survival. So in the first year, that is when you're gonna to need to do the most maintenance. That's when your planting is gonna be most uh, sensitive when we're trying to just get it established. 
So we wanna to remember to water during dry periods. Even once we've got um, some new plant growth, I still encourage you to water at least one inch per week during that very first year. Uh, especially the self heal will be thanking you, but it's just good for plant establishment on the whole. Uh, we wanna limit competition that our weeds are gonna, that excuse me, our flowers are gonna face. So you're gonna wanna pull weeds and really try and get them on the while they're small. If you look at the plants running along the bottom here, these are three different images of Siberian elm. I think it goes without saying that the Siberian, the Siberian elm furthest to the left is gonna be a little bit easier to pull than the Siberian elm furthest to the right. And I encourage you to overseed as needed. If it's coming in a little patchy, take some seed, spread it across the area and, uh, and fill in those patchy spots. Uh, with regards to mowing, I always like to recommend mowing based on the height of your lawn. If you're trying to go for a conventional look, let your lawn grow out to four and a half inches and cut it back to three inches. What we're trying to do is follow the rule of one third. And what the rule of one third says is we never wanna cut off more than one third of our total lawn height. So if we're letting our lawn grow out to four and a half inches, one third of that is 1.5 inches. So we want our final height after mowing to be three inches. If you don't mind letting things grow out a little bit taller, you will see more blooms. So an alternative uh, mowing method that I would highly recommend is letting that lawn area grow out to six inches, cutting back to four inches, and believe me, the bees will thank you. Um, something to keep in mind is that if we're uh, mowing less frequently, there is some potential for thatch to build up. With that being the mind, with that being the case, I would recommend an occasional dethatching. Um, there are machines to do this where you run it across your lawn surface and it'll pull out that thatch. And when I say thatch, it's kind of that, um, that area just below where your uh, grass is. And it kind of just has like a dead or dying vegetation, dead or dying turf grass material. And we want to get that out of the area to uh, reduce compaction, just to make a healthier surface. So once per year, uh, after that green up in the spring, I would recommend cleaning out your lawn area with a dethatching machine. This is another machine that you could probably get at a Home Depot or a Lowe's, rent it for not too much of a charge, and it'll really help you uh, maintain a healthy lawn. Uh, with fertilizer, you really don't have to fertilize much at all. If you have Dutch white clover in there, the area should be getting all the nitrogen that it needs. If there's a severe brown up, I would say you can add a little bit of nitrogen based fertilizer. I wouldn't say to use any, uh, any phosphorus on a fully established lawn, but if you have an, a uh, mature lawn that's got a little bit of a brown up, you can consider spreading, I'd say maybe half a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. With irrigation, these areas are going to be super drought tolerant. Once you have a fully established lawn, so regular maintenance after year one, once you have a fully established lawn, I would only water once every 14 days or so, and only if there's been no natural rain event. So if you go 14 days without rain, consider applying some irrigation. But in general, these areas are gonna be super drought tolerant. They're gonna look really good, even if we're getting some direct heat with very little rainfall. So with that being the case, I want to again thank the partners that helped make this presentation possible. Organic Bob over in Minneapolis, um, all of the Blue Thumb partners that you could find at bluethumb.org, and of course Bowser, the uh, State of Minnesota's Board of, Board of Water and Soil Resources. They are fantastic. We've got a Lawns to Legumes program out there that's all about helping residents convert uh, parts of their lawn to pollinator-friendly alternatives. So even though you're not in Minnesota, I'd recommend checking out the resources over there. They are super uh, informative. Um, I would encourage all of you to check out the Blue Thumb website. That website is full of Blue Thumb partners and resources that are all about what we're talking about today. Creating areas that, uh, that help us harbor clean water, that help us protect our pollinators. So really check out the Blue Thumb website. It's a great resource for all residents if, if you're in Minnesota, if you're outside of Minnesota, wherever you live, the Blue Thumb website's gonna have fantastic information for you. And additionally, if you want a little help um, creating a bee lawn, I encourage you to, to visit the bee lawn, excuse me, to visit the Metro Blooms website. 
There you can schedule a BLON consultation and I can give you kind of step-by-step -step directions to establish a BLON uh, at your home. Uh, we do virtual consultations, so this would happen over Zoom, and I am happy to help anyone that wants to get one of these established. Once again, you could get one of those at the, you could sign up for those at the uh, Metro Blooms website. So thank you for uh, giving me your time. I hope this was an informative and fun presentation, and I hope that all of you will be planting bee lawns in the near future. Take care.